Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Every week, I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in, and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well, because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast, where we're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And um, you know what? If you've ever wanted to know what steps to take to create your own micro empire, then guess what? This is absolutely the conversation that you're going to want to listen to until the very last word, I promise. Because today's guest at, uh, at age 40 as a single mom had no assets, no retirement account, and some would say no money. You know what? And it didn't just happen to her once. It happened to her twice. And I really want her to talk to us about how that happened. Because you know what? Afterwards, over the span of four years, with her W-2 job and a whole lot of grit, she was able to create over $1 million of income-producing investments that helped her to get on the right track. She's also the founder of Jennifer I. Grimson Investments, as well as the host of the super popular podcast, Micro Empires Podcast. Really happy to welcome to the show, Jennifer Grimson. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, Philly. I am super excited to be here. <laughs> this is going to be such an amazing conversation. I'm already, already positive about that. So um, listen, Jennifer, you know, the, you know the deal here. I like to ask everybody, well, the same kind of five questions, and we're going to start with two. We'll end with the other three, but um, let's start with the first one. Where do you live in the United States? I live in Nashville, Tennessee, which is, uh, if you aren't familiar with the United States, it's the South, it's a state in the South Central area of the country. So it's still warm here. Um, And I actually live in the East Side, which if you've been to Nashville, you understand it. Um, And it's a really cool town. So I've been here about 15 years, but that's where I am at this exact moment. All right. Fantastic. Nashville. I've actually been here for just over 15 years as well. And yes, I can say Nashville is a pretty awesome town. I was there back in 1996, I think it was. Oh, you um, need to come back. It's changed okay. a lot. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I got it back there then. Um, so listen, so that was kind of where you are. Help us understand what is the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? You know, um, a, a lot of things have happened. Just, I mean, I think at this time in our lives, I'm just so grateful for health and everything else. But we, um, we've we stayed pretty locked down. But because Nashville's still warm, we were able to go out to dinner last night, sit outside um, and have a dinner. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for little things like that at this point, because that's not possible everywhere else. So yeah, got to I've- see people, not be with people, but see them. Oh, that's, that's great. And I, I love the fact that you just helped to remind us it's many times those little things, just being outside with loved ones and being able to have a nice dinner. So, uh, so mm-hmm. awesome. Um, so listen, I've kind of told a little teeny tiny bit of your story, but everyone would love to know if you could give us in your own words, a little bit more about uh, your backstory, maybe tell us about some of the things that you've done that helped you get to this point in your journey. And also most importantly, like some of the different decisions that you've made along the way. Yeah. So my story is that I lost everything twice. I usually just start off by saying that because that encapsulate, encapsulate it, encapsulates it. Um, and when I say I lost everything, I found myself with no money, no job, no car, no place to live, um, and two children who I was the sole financial responsibility for. The second time it happened, I realized, because um, I had corporate jobs. So the second time it happened, I realized that I needed to set up an environment, a life of what I call micro empires, like little tiny empires that belong to me. So if anything gave, I lost my job or, you know, I had a bad breakup or I made a bad investment that there would be other things to fall back on. And so that's what I did um, over a period I mean, it took a while to rebuild my credit. I also had been in Chapter 13 bankruptcy twice. Um, But once I rebuilt the credit, it really was short time. In four years, I created $1.4 million in income-producing investments. Um, And I did that largely through real estate. 
Uh, and I just um, realized in that process that there were a lot of tools that were already at my disposal that I really wasn't aware of. I wasn't aware of how to manipulate those tools. So I created the podcast um, because I wanted to share that, but also I had kept that a secret. That was, uh, I was very, very ashamed. And most people are. Most people who are making financial mistakes are very ashamed. And in the United States, most people uh, are not financially secure. So I, I decided that I was going to share the story and just come right out and say what has happened and what it has unlocked is, and what I'm creating is an environment where people can just be honest about where they are and where they can begin. Um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell. Wow. So I think that's a, that, I mean, that's a, that's a big concept, right? To, to feel comfortable about where you are um, and have a safe place to be able to do that. You know, I'm going to pick up on a couple of things that you just mentioned. You, you talked about um, people feeling ashamed, right? People feeling ashamed. And I'm just curious, like kind of what, what do you believe is the reason that people feel ashamed? Um, and, and what specifically do you think they're ashamed of? Well, you know, you do in your show, you ask a series of questions. In my show, I always open with one question. I always ask the guests, what, what is your money culture? What did you grow up in hmm. your money culture? Because um, in the United States specifically, uh, there's a, there's a national money culture. There's a culture that you grow up in. There's a culture that you have in your, in your marriage. Um, there's a culture of the town you live in or the city you live in. And I, um, there is a lot of pressure to have an appearance that you are better off than you are in the United States. And um, that therefore um, causes shame because statistically the average American cannot afford a $400 emergency. And much of that is a healthcare crisis because unlike in, in Europe, um, we are strapped with how to deal with our own healthcare and it's very expensive. Um, but a $400 emergency. And now in this business that I'm creating, I talk to people about their money every day. And I talk to people that are in crisis and I talk to people who are earning well over six figures and are in crisis because they spend as much as they make and more because they had no financial literacy. Uh, we don't really teach it in schools here. So if you want to get financially literate, you really are on your own, probably after you get out of high school to find that out. So I, I think that's where the shame comes from. And there's this pressure to, to have this attitude of, oh, I've got it all together and I have no worries. And um, just within a few questions, I'm usually able to find out that most people have either been in my situation or are close to being in that situation that I was in. Oh, okay. So, so either having been there or being close to, uh, to, to being there. And, I, and I'm sure that that helps you to really make a connection with a lot of the different people that you are, um, that you're also helping and that you're also to educating. Um, you, you also said something interesting. Well, th first, thanks for, uh, for clarifying that just in terms of the uh, shame, because I think that's a, such a strong word uh, and you really help us to identify with that and, and part of that culture, uh, whether it be at a, at a macro level or at a, Micro level. Micro so, level. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, so one of the other things that you you mentioned, you said that it's a tool to manipulate. I love that, right? And I think sometimes if people hear you say manipulate a certain tool, they may not really understand because I, I know what you mean by that. But if you can help to clarify, because I think it's such a powerful way to 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 set yourself free or on the on the right path. Right. Um, yeah. Manipulation can be a, a bad word and it can be a really good word. So, and I, if I had to make a blanket statement, I would say to anybody listening to the show, the first thing I recommend to people is take a look at what you have right now. And if you can manipulate any of that or use it in a different way, because a lot of us don't do that. We, we, we decide we're going to go off and make a big investment and make money there when there might be something you can do that you're already doing. So when I talk about manipulation, I mean, um, I had to, I, I didn't know that I could borrow against my 401k, which is a retirement savings while I was working. I didn't know that I could purchase a home for 3% down as long as I moved into it. I didn't know that I could take an old 401k and turn it into a tool that allows me to invest in real estate. 
Um, so those are just some of the tools. The the four hundred one k as a as a corporate person here in the United States, I was like, oh yeah, I'm contributing to that. Blah blah blah. I didn't really know much about it. Didn't really understand much about it. Once I realized how it could be used to pay off debt or to buy houses, I bought two houses by borrowing against a four hundred one k. Paid off a car. You can pay off your student loans. You can do a lot of things. Um, and there's no penalty or tax because. Because I mean, I consider myself a pretty smart person, but I think like many people in the corporate world, I believe my 401k was untouchable until I reached the age of 59. And if I did touch it in any way that I would have to pay taxes and penalty. And that's just not true. Yeah. And so, and also too, and this is just part of, you know, doing the podcasting, one of the things that you're sharing with us, and you gave us some really good, cool examples around the 401k and you, how you can also be able to tap into that to pay off different uh, obligations that you may have. I want all of our listeners and our viewers to know that like one of the things Jennifer's not sharing tax advice with you, she's just sharing her own experience. So what yeah. we're talking about now is you want to make sure that you look at what we're talking about and, and understand that with your specific tax advisors or whoever your advisors are, right? And so I appreciate you sharing that with us. And I just wanted to also make sure that everybody here that's watching and listening also knows that we're sharing uh, sharing stories to help you become much more informed. So, um, th- you know, and so you kind of already took part of it because you talked about being able to, like you didn't know about the 401k. And then once you found out about it, it really opened up this whole new universe of possibilities, which goes back to what we were talking about before, to be able to manipulate a particular tool, meaning that you get the most out of that specific tool um, when you are, when, well, when you, when you learn about it, right? Um, right. How nervous were you when you found out that, hey, listen, you know what? I can actually tap into my 401k and actually do some things that don't feel right. Well, one of the things about being uh, flat broke and homeless twice does for you is it gives you the attitude of like, well, what have I got to lose, right? So um, the first thing that I had to do was to, I mean, initially it was to find a place to live, obviously, mm-hmm. and I lived with my sister and then rented a place, but ultimately purchased a home. Um, and did it the old fashioned way. I had terrible credit. So I purchased a home, had to put down a huge down payment, moved into my home. Um, realized that everything, you know, when I talk about manipulation, everything has to have more than one job. So I felt that my home had to do more than just provide shelter. So I started renting out to friends and then I discovered Airbnb and that was a real game changer. But when, um, which is funny because when you talk about nervousness, I discovered Airbnb in 2014. And when I was telling people about it, they're like, what do you mean you're going to let people sleep on your couch? And I said, what I mean is that in six nights, I can pay my mortgage. That's what I mean. So I didn't care. And I just started couch surfing, you know, with, at friends' houses. Um, so I had no, I had like nothing to lose. I was willing mm. to try anything. Uh, when I discovered the 401k avenue, and I had an old 401k, which is really how I, how I got started initially, but I was also still working a job. So I was contributing heavily to that. Mm-hmm. Um I had done my due diligence. So part of the reason I call the show Micro Empires is I encourage people, I'm not a big risk taker. So I encourage people to take micro risks, to take Mm -hmm. little steps. So I spent a lot of time getting to know people interviewing people who specialize in it, interview people who who know uh, had done it before, before I took the leap. And the first thing I did was I borrowed to pay off a car and then I borrowed again to buy a house. And it was like for 3% down. Um, and it was just a no brainer. It just made complete sense. Um, so I really wasn't that nervous. And then when I moved the bigger old 401k, it was $150,000. That's also something that I do on my shows. I, I share all the numbers mm-hmm. because a lot, a lot of the real estate shows or the things that I've seen, they're, they're kind of very vague. So I like mm-hmm. to let people where I was. So I moved $150,000 into a self-directed IRA, mm-hmm. but it was just sitting there anyway. It's not like it was outperforming on the stock market and you can still move it in there and invest in the stock market. You don't have to put it into real estate, but I purchased stock in a company that allows me to travel the world in luxury. That was number one. It doesn't pay me, but it pays me in travel. And, uh, and then the other was I made an investment. Um, actually that investment is in land, which we are going to liquidate, um, and probably put back into multifamily or storage. So, and, and there's a number of different areas that you can go into, right? Multifamily storage, you can land bank, and, and they give you different uh, profiles of risk and return. Uh, 
which I think also just shows that it, it, you can do a number of different things with it within a similar asset class, right? So looking mm-hmm. at real assets, but there's also something that you said, I just want to highlight that it's not all about the money, right? You also have part of your investment is about getting an emotional return because you love to travel, right? Right. Right. Okay. I did, I did a video episode about alternate investing and I did it from a place in Mexico that because I, because we made this investment in a company called third home, um, we have access to these luxury locations all over the world. And so I, I did this video from a four bedroom, 6,000 square foot suite in Mexico that I stayed at for like under a thousand dollars for a week. So I don't have, and actually I'm, I'm going to offer for your listeners. Uh, we'll put a link in here because there is a way to do this without being an investor or having a luxury home and it's not a timeshare. So I'd love to share that with your traveling audience. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think an investment for me, an investment has to pay me cash or it has to give me something that I need anyway, whether that's education, you know, mm-hmm. or um, something that I really want in my life. And travel is certainly, you know, something that I love to do. I'm also a very big fan of travel. <laughs> I think we've As talked about that. All people in Europe are, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hey, speaking of which, so I know that you had a, an opportunity to live overseas, Right. Mm-hmm. And so I'm always curious. I know you, you, you lived in Russia and, um, it, which in a, my, an amazing city that I, I visited back um, in the mid 90s, something like that. Um, but I, I'm interested to know from your perspective, like how that experience living overseas is actually benefiting you and the, in the people that you're working with, your team, your investors. How, how did that international experience help you in what you're doing today add more value to other people? You know, I lived in Russia while it was still communist. So um, I was there studying as a student. Um, I was there for about five months. And so that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think universally what it taught me, I mean, I knew... I went to school in San Francisco and I was a liberal college kid and all those things, but I knew at my heart that I was a capitalist and I knew that I was also a patriot. So I, when I went to Russia, it underscored um, just experiencing a true communist society and what that looks like and what it does to the people. And, and communist as communism as a core is an equal opportunity to poverty. That's what it is. Um, that doesn't take away from socialist programs, which can benefit whole, um, whole communities. But at the time, living in a country where everybody that I knew, and I'm still friends with my Russian friends to this day, many of them have emigrated to the United States, um, Having an experience with folks that had grown up in an environment where it doesn't matter how hard you work, you're not going to do better than the person next to you who's not working hard at all. And that is not for me. So it solidified, um, you know, my my card carrying capitalist uh, identity. And, um, you know, it just it it was an incredible lesson that that I carry through to today. You know, and I, I thought a lot of times when you can get those lessons and that, that are still with you, even to this day, right? It, a lot of times people think, well, it's about all the things that I want, the experiences that you go through in life. Many times it's about re- being able to recognize the things that you don't want in your mm-hmm. life. Right. And so yeah. um, I think, I think it's, um, uh, well, it, it's Robert Kiyosaki, right? This is, there's three sides to every coin. So you kind of look either one and you, and you, and you look on the, on the edge and figure out what, what you want for yourself, for your life, for your family. And so, um, that's, that's just another example of yeah. having had that. So, um, another thing, so you've also, uh, had the opportunity, I know you've worked in sales and we speak to a lot of people that are in the, uh, in the sales environment here and, and some part of the, I think one of the best professions, if not the best profession ever, um, created, invented, I guess. Um, and I'm curious also too, like as you think about the, the the sales experience that you had, right? And that you still carry today, um, how is that helping you in your interactions with your investors? Yeah, I, I sales is everything. So I got my, you know, when I started into sales, I didn't want to go into sales because I thought, oh, it's smarmy. It's, but I had a totally different mindset. I had a really, um, you know, uh, 
poverty mindset, you know, Mm. and I didn't understand, but sales is the only job that you can have other than being a CEO where you have exposure to every level in a business. Every, if you have a big deal on the table, the CEO, no matter how big the company is interested in you and you have access to all of the workings of the organization, you will do the same at the organizations that you're selling to. You're selling, especially once you're up in the C-suite and selling. So my sales career, uh, I was very grateful to because it gave me uh, the money to survive uh, the financial downfalls that I had. And it gave me the freedom to be with my kids. I was a full-time single mom. I had full custody. And and I, I didn't say this before, but I'll say it now. My financial mistakes, the reasons, the reason I ended up in that situation twice was because I was sued 25 times in 10 years by my ex-husband. Now, I don't think it really matters how I got there, but some people overspend, you know, by like, you know, they just spend beyond their means. That wasn't the case with me, but it doesn't matter. It's how I got there. And uh, it's a career that it's the only career that it doesn't matter what gender you are, what race you are. All that matters is how you perform. And I'd rather be measured on my performance than anything else. Um, So that is um, tantamount to my life. And and in this business here, as I'm building my team, like, like you've done, the one thing I don't need help with I do not need help selling. (laughs) And that would be a very expensive item to hire someone if I didn't know how to sell, how to network, how to make it rain. Yeah. And and that is really, really important. And and part of the reason of asking that question, right, is a lot of times people are focused on the the sales aspect and being able to bring in the capital, all those things that you talked about. And you, it goes back to also one of the things you talked about before. It's not always just about the money and just have understanding that sales process when you're interacting with prospective investors, for instance, um, what is having had that experience and understanding how to interact with, you know, a new prospective client, like, having that previous sales experience, how does that you believe help you engage with the, with the person that you have in front of you? Well, I, in, in the, the um, system that I'm setting up now, I'm, I'm not investors are coming to me, but I'm not taking investors, but I am the investor Mm -hmm. uh, going to other, whether it's joint venture or syndication, et cetera. Um, I think the skill it has given me is, um, can I swear on this episode? You, you, as long as you keep it light. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if not, we'll, we'll get, we'll Listen, worry about it. Go swearing ahead. Just is, go. It's, Just it's go. my Just drug go. of choice. Yeah. <laughs> Just go. Um, like sales has taught me like my ability to tolerate bullshit is zero. Hmm. And so it's yeah. very easy for me to, to get the feeling that I can trust or not trust you, which is yeah. part of it. But, but my gut, you know, you can't just go on your gut. My gut has been wrong in the past. Yeah. Um, I'm unafraid to ask questions. I'm unafraid to ask for anything I want, whether mm. that's, you know, a higher position or more equity or whatever it is that we're talking about, unafraid yeah. to negotiate. And um, as a whole, women tend to not ask for what they need as a whole, that's in mm. all parts of their lives. So that alone um, is something that I learned in sales. And uh, it's probably the strongest muscle I have right now is my ability to ask for things. So I think that is fantastic in those interactions, right? Either you're looking at prospective uh, prospective investors or customers, or you are that prospective investor. So that those are the types of skills that I think are invaluable for anyone. So thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, there, there's also another point of you, you mentioned being successful in sales. Um, you've had lots and lots of accolades. At the same time, you got to a certain point, Jennifer, where you realized like you didn't just want to keep working for big companies and you yeah. had to make the decision to kind of pivot and leave yeah. that security or leave that whatever you want to call it. Can you talk us through some of how, what that felt like, what that emotion was like when you made that decision and kind of what drove you to that point that it was time to do something else? Yeah. I have an episode called the one year mark. And the day that I decided to leave my corporate job, I recorded, um, I had no idea I was going to be doing a podcast in the future, but I recorded um, a, a memo on my phone that just was me walking through 
what and why I, and what I was feeling. And I was terrified, absolutely terrified. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I'm not a huge risk, risk taker. <clears throat> and I had built, what I had done was created um, three short-term rental properties here in Nashville, Tennessee. And the, the tourism industry had exploded. These properties were performing, you know, phenomenally. And I had promised myself that once <clears throat> I always keep numbers in my head and I knew what the numbers were that I had to have to be comfortable enough to try something different. I knew there wouldn't be room for something else in my life if I didn't leave my corporate job because it takes 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Plus you're traveling. So um, I decided that once those houses were kicking off cash flowing $60,000 a year, that I would quit the job. I made myself that promise. Now in the United States, the only other concern is health insurance. Um, my children are grown, so I, I didn't have that obligation anymore. And I, I had been single for 20 years, but I had recently married. So I, you know, I don't want it to make it sound like um, I just jumped off and got my own health insurance because it's a big consideration, but I'm able to be insured with my husband, which is, which is good. Uh, but that recording, uh, I'm terrified. I'm absolutely terrified, but I'm also absolutely miserable. Uh, I was good at what I did and I hated it. I stayed for three reasons, the money, the money, the money, that's it. And so I quit that job on November 28th, 2018. And right after that, for the three months following for the first time in five years, five years, four years, all three properties sat empty. Yeah. At a drain. Yeah. At a drain of $7,000 a month. So I'm sweating bullets because that was my carrying cost, $7,000 a month. Um, I'm sweating bullets. And here in Nashville, it's Music City. It's it's also a healthcare technology hub, but there are a lot of Grammy award-winning musicians. So I have a friend who said to me, oh, that's just the universe testing you. And I said, well, the universe can kiss my butt because <laughs> I've been tested. I don't need to be tested anymore. Um, but what it did, uh, so, you know, the short answer to your question is that I was terrified, but I did it anyway because I mm. promised myself and because I had abandoned myself over and over and over again. And I say this to people all the time. I have to remind myself all the time, don't abandon yourself. Um, but it also, another part of my investment strategy is once an asset starts to underperform to what I'm comfortable with. I am quick to let it go. I am quick to get out and move on. Um, my husband is the type of investor will he'll hold on. So short-term rental is a great example. That year, 2019, those properties did not perform as well as they had before. And I decided first I unloaded the one that was a really poor performer immediately in, in 19. And then I unloaded the other two in February of 2020, 30 days before COVID hit. So I'm very fortunate in that, but it really was because I was looking at it going, this is not, this is not, there are easier ways to make money than short-term yeah. rental. How did, I'm sorry to interrupt, but how did, how did you know that it was like, it was not performing against what, Standard, because I think a lot of times people just hold on to properties because they're still making money and da da da. But you you hit on something here, which is they weren't performing. Performing against what? Well, performing against the numbers that they had been performing against. Watching the competition. So here in Nashville, the tourist industry exploded, and once people started to understand what Airbnb was, you know, there are investors coming in building buildings with rooftop pools mm-hmm. and fireplaces, and I can't compete with my little houses. Um, on those where they had been, you know, uh, performing, they were still doing much better than a long-term rental. Um, but also the other shift was Nashville had become, was putting in a lot of regulation. And part of why I like being an entrepreneur, a podcaster an investor is because I don't like to be told what to do. So the city kept putting regulation after regulation after regulation. And I just was like, I didn't get into this for that. I got Mm -hmm. into this because it's my asset and being a true American, I'm like, you're not going to tell me what to do. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was it. It was still performing better than a long term. And when COVID hit, I watched, and I'm still watching folks who are still in that industry. It will come back. Short term rental is not going anywhere. It has shifted our economy entirely. Mm-hmm. But I watched people hang on, hang on, hang on, and not pivot. And across the board, those are the 
those are the businesses that are suffering the most, the ones that didn't go, something has radically changed. Let's pivot, even if we have to go back to what we're doing before, but that's universally true over here in the States. Okay. And that, that, uh, that's also helpful. Give us an idea in terms of when it was underperforming uh, kind of against what was going on there and and you having that ability to adapt and move quickly is something that can, can give you a, a major advantage. I'm also, because we've kind of talked around it a little bit and you've mentioned it. And I know that you are also really big into going out, sharing your experience, helping other people uh, in their journey. So tell us a little bit about what you are doing over at Micro Empires and who are the people that you are typically helping and, and when you're engaging with them, what does that, what does that look like? What does that feel like as well? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the micro empires, the whole, every single show, I want you to be able to walk away with something that you can do. You could do that day. And I really focus on not, I mean, I wouldn't say like the average person, because what's average? I don't know what average is, but there, I really focus on giving tactical steps that you can take that day. Part of moving into investing or entrepreneurship or anything else is the overwhelming um, you know, size of what it seems like to you. And you don't have to start that way. You could start with micro risks, micro information, micro investing, you know, everything can be done in small chunks. And I, I couldn't take big risks because I had children to think of. I couldn't put it all on the line. That was not, that wasn't the advice for me. I wasn't going to go like, quit your job and jump off the bridge and follow your dreams. I'm like, yeah, well, my dreams are to be spoon fed for the rest of my right. life, but that's not happening. <laughs> so I just, that is the goal. And I have people um, who pitch to be a guest on my show and they're very, very successful and that's wonderful. But if they can't boil it down to what anybody can do, then they're not a good fit for my show. Um, And so I always need them to reach back into their roots I mean, you know, I'd love Gary Vaynerchuk to be on my show or Tony Robbins, but what I'm really interested in is the little steps they took in the beginning, because that's where most of us are. Um, And and most of us there who, whether you're making 40,000 or 400,000, that's the American truth. So. Mm. No, that's, um, and and I would even take it a bit more global. I think it's a global truth, um, which is, which is, uh, which, which is great. And it's also one of the great ways that you're giving back that you're helping uh, others to, to, to understand really those actionable steps um, because that's what makes the biggest impact on, on, on our lives individually. So um, I guess there's a certain point where like, I just want to keep talking to you forever. I want to keep asking you things. (laughs) Like and talking about your life and all the things that you're doing and 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 you know what there's always the opportunity to come back right so that's the right. that's the cool thing um but I do want to ask one last question before we go into the uh, going long uh, final three mm-hmm. and you're like an open book it feels great being able to speak to you and I'm just curious because you mentioned also having children you're in a demanding corporate job. You knew it was time for you to do something else. So you wanted to pivot. And I'm, I'm, I'd really love for you to help us understand what role humility has played in your life to allow you to get to where you are. Oh my God. Uh, that is such a good question, by the way. Well done. Um, I think humility is huge. I think, uh, you know, coming to my sister and having no place to live and she and her family taking us in for four months until I could find a job was humility. Mm -hmm. Um, Calling people up and asking them, I need a job like now um, was humility. But also when I decided to become, once I, you know, had a home and had an income, had a good income and was doing really well as a salesperson, I wanted to get into investing. I knew real estate would be a piece of it. I knew that. So I joined a real estate investor group and I'll never forget. I walked in and mostly men, big group here in Nashville, great group. And they were speaking a language I'd never heard of self-directed IRA, 1031 exchanges, syndication, uh, joint ventures, you know, None of those words did I understand. Uh, and people would ask me, well, what are you doing? Are you a buy and hold? Are you new build? Are you a developer? I'm like, I don't know what I am. What are you doing? Do you do hard money? What's that? I don't know. And I'm going to show um, 
something to your listeners yeah, yeah. for those that are watching. One of the things that I did was I had and a by, card. And by the way, if you're not watching before she says this, you should move over to the video version and watch what she's getting ready to show. I don't even know this. So I'm excited. <laughs> so exciting. Um, and you know, so humility was, I, I am, I am not afraid to ask questions. Probably one of the best compliments I got was from a 26 year old multimillion dollar CEO who said to me, I've never met someone your age, which I didn't punch him in the face for that comment. <laughs> but he, I said, he said, I've never met someone your age who's so as curious and wants to hear from someone my age. And I thought, you know, curiosity has kept me young, but it was the humility to go in and go, I have no idea what anybody's talking about and I'm here to learn. But the second time I went back, I brought this with me. It's a little business card and it just says this. And on the back, I knew enough to say, here's my title was investor, entrepreneur, artist, and that's it. So that I had something because I also believe it's not really fake it till you make it, but it is kind of like act as if. So I showed up and I was like, I own a piece of property. Therefore I'm an investor. Um, but yeah, humility is a huge part of my life every single day. Okay. Awesome. And thanks for, thanks for sharing that story. Um, pretty awesome business card there, by the way. It looked, Thank you. Uh, I love looked it. Very cool. So, and I'm not going to even describe it because people should go over and watch the video version so you can check out what it looks like. Wow. That's I, awesome. Very simple. <laughs> very simple. It is very, very cool. Very cool. Uh, Jennifer, I guess this is kind of, we need to get to the going long final three. And so the okay. thing is, I never ask the question unless you tell me that you're ready for me to ask you the going long final three. Are you ready? Lay it on me. I'm ready. I knew you were ready. You're born ready. <laughs> so it's awesome. Here we go. So the first question of the going long final three is we started over on that side of the pond. I want to bring it back this way to Europe because that's where I live. And I would love to know what is your favorite European city that you've either visited or is still on your bucket list to visit? Uh, there's a million on my bucket list. So I will say, um, I, well, we went to Portugal just before mm -hmm. everything shut down and we spent a lot of time in Lisbon, 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 sorry, mm -hmm. which I loved, but I want to say Porto. Oh, oh very my nice. God, I love that okay. city. Okay. Yeah. Good. Cause I, you know, I'm a redhead, so it's like <laughs> the sun is overrated, you know, so it's a little, it's a little colder up there and we stay in our turtlenecks a little longer. So very cool. That's right. my that's favorite. I love that's it. That's the first vo vote for Porto. So uh, mm -hmm. Porto, so which is awesome. Okay. So we'll take that. Thank you very much. We'll include that in show notes. Ah, the second question has to do with, well, like I say, all of like really successful people have only made mm, literally one, well, okay, maybe a couple more than one mistakes or learning opportunities or whatever you want to call them. And since you're a successful person, I really would love for you to share, like, I guess more than dwell on the mistake or the, or, or the, or the learning opportunity, really, what was the lesson that you learned that you would kind of pay forward to us so that maybe somebody doesn't make the exact same mistake that you did? Right. Uh, well, first of all, I would say I make mistakes all the time. So I'm not a person who says, oh, I've only made a couple of mistakes. Yeah. Me too. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm a mistake machine, man. It's kind of what I do. I eat them for breakfast. Um, my, my advice is never, ever, ever, ever turn your financial well being over to another human being at all. Not your husband, not your wife, not even, and I'm, you know, I'm not saying financial advisors are bad or anything, but don't show up and just be like, here you go. You manage it. You have to be involved and you must take control. And it, this is part of the thing. Like, even if all you have is $5,000, it's yours and therefore it's an empire. So that's how I felt. I'm like, I, yes, you're going to spend a lot of time with me. So, and that is exactly how I got into that situation twice. I turned my financial well being over to someone else and let it go. And that'll never happen again. Right, so don't, uh, so don't do that. Words of wisdom. And then uh, mm -hmm. lastly, talking about wisdom. So what book would you uh, recommend to the Going Long audience? Well, I know you get a lot of real estate books, um, which are great. Uh, but I think, especially because of your audience, the book that changed my life the most was The 4-Hour Workweek, mm -hmm. which I read when it first came out. That yeah. changed my attitude. Um, and you know what? My dad had passed away and he had saved, done the usual work, 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 retired at mm -hmm. 65. Six months later, he was gone. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest lesson I got out of that was don't wait for your retirement, take it now, which Europeans have a much better take on that because they take vacations, et cetera. But yeah. it did teach me to shift. And I also, that's probably when I was like, I don't want to climb a corporate ladder. I want my own ladder. 
So it changed my life. Okay. The four hour work week. So we'll definitely include that in the show notes as well. Um, and so I guess, listen, so we've been chatting for a while and you have been very, very gracious with your stories, with your time. Um, you know, I mean, you shared with us, you know, being able to kind of go through the same situation twice. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about being able to, you know, hustle things through, put in grit and hard work and being focused on what it is that you wanted to do when you ran into challenges. Well, you pivoted. You didn't just wait forever. Um, you realized that having responsibility for your own uh, financial life is something that is up to you and you're helping other people to make it up to them. Uh, it's not about the macro, although that's something that's important. What affects each and every one of us and you know, what affects you is what's happening micro, right? And you're helping people to understand how they can build their own micro empires. And, and I know that through the different stories that you've shared through all of the different things that you are helping us, there are so many people that are like, Jennifer, I need to talk to you. <laughs> like, I've got to talk to you. I got to connect with you. How's that going to happen? So what I would love for you to do, Jennifer, is share with the Going Long audience, what is the best way to contact you and or your team? Uh, you know, my website's probably easy. So it's uh, micro-empires.com. And on there, I have a, a book. It's a free book called How to Pivot and Thrive. Um, really under, it's a system that I've used always. And you can download that book. It's free. There's no obligation, nothing. You can, you can read through it and fill it out. It's really a booklet. It's just, a, it's not very long or you can fill out, there's a form you can fill out a form and I'll get it and I'll respond and you can book time to talk with me. Uh, but of course on all the socials, either micro empires or Jennifer Grimson. Okay, perfect. So you make that really easy. So I'm just going to repeat that. And I'm going to just remind everybody that's part of the going along audience, go ahead and go over to the following website, micro dash empires.com. She made it really simple. You can go around lots of information, podcasts, uh, resources, uh, as she mentioned as well. Leave your name, leave your uh, email address, and you'll be able to connect with Jennifer Grimson. So, right. um, Jennifer. And, su and subscribe and review. Subscribe um, and review. Yeah. Before we go, that. I yeah. think we have to take a moment to identify how you and I met. Oh, you know, you, you, that's so funny. <laughs> I was just getting ready to say um, it's really, I, was getting so ready to say this. Yes, so he will hear it. So uh, we'd like to throw this shout out to uh, Mr. Eric Shaver for making a connection here. And um, yeah, so we appreciate that. That was really funny. I was literally just getting ready. <laughs> you know what? I met Eric. I just want to say this. So I met Eric in Boston at a startup. Um, and it has to have been, I don't even remember. Well, it, it was when 9-11 happened. So it was 2001. Um, so 21, 20 years uh, ago. And that's just a testimony to... Yeah. you know, how important your network is and keep your network going. I haven't seen, I haven't laid eyes on that man in 20 years, but we still keep right. in touch. Yeah. So um, keep the network going. And then I get yeah. to meet amazing people like you. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, so with that, that was really funny. I was literally getting ready to say that. So, <laughs> um, so thanks E for, for making that happen. And um, yeah, listen, Jennifer, you've shared so much goodness. I really want to thank you for taking the time to invest with me in this conversation today and the entire going long audience. It's been awesome. 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 So thank you very much uh, for the time. It's been really fun. I really appreciate it. I love talking to you and it's, we never have enough time. So I never. really love it. Never, it's awesome. never, never, never. Cool. So, and listen to the going on audience. Uh, I want to thank you once again for investing your time with Jennifer and I today. Uh, listen, Jennifer left so much goodness here. She's given you very micro actionable steps that you can take so that you can start to move your life in the direction that you really want it to be in. Um, and, you know, I know that both Jennifer and I would love for you to let us know what you think. Like what, what parts of the conversation did you like? What would you love for her to come back and talk to us more about in the, in the future? Um, and when you're leaving those reviews, let us know. Like we just, we, we really want to know. And if you want to make them a five-star review, we'll take those as well. So um, yeah, we're, 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 we're open to those. Um, and I guess share this episode with two or three other people. You can make a positive impact on their lives and, uh, and you'll be that person that was responsible. Just like we were just talking about Eric uh, connected the two of us. And so, Hey, listen, it's, a, it's another great way to, uh, to connect people. And so until I get the opportunity to welcome you back to the next conversation, I just want to say thank you very much and go out and make it a great day. Freedom. Wow. Don't you love hearing from top notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. 
So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. So go out and make it a great day.